Thanks. Thanks very much uh, to both of you for inviting me and uh, again to this excellent meeting. It's great division of topics and always a fabulous group of speakers as well. Uh, so uh, these topics, when I got these topics, I was like, well, you know, we didn't have like big news at San Antonio. Uh, but it turned out, you know, once you go through all the details, there was actually quite a bit of interesting information. And also, uh, what I did was take the opportunity to review some of the data that we've heard at various meetings this year, uh, including at the European Society of Medical Oncology, which many of you may not pop over to Copenhagen to attend, um, and uh, had some interesting data in it. And I think it'll fit in really nicely with the next next talk uh, by uh, Debu. So uh, the CDK4-6 inhibitors, there were uh, some subset analyses and a very interesting neoadjuvant trial uh, with the CDK4-6 inhibitor of Uh There are new combinations of Erolimus that I'm not going to talk about. You're going to hear more about them in the next talk, but they're in a table, so I thought I would mention them just as a comparator. And then tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, you know, lots of studies on TILs, now meta-analyses and pooled analyses, et cetera. Uh, we haven't quite figured out where we're putting them into the clinic. Uh, and immunotherapy, a lot of new trials, new directions, uh, thinking about this area in breast cancer. Uh, so cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6 inhibitors are our newest targeted agent uh, that's demonstrated, been demonstrated to improve progression-free survival and response rates in hormone receptor-positive advanced breast cancer. Um, and we know that growth of hormone receptor positive breast cancer is dependent on cyclin D1, uh, and this is a transcriptional target of the estrogen receptor. And then uh, cyclin D1 activates the enzyme cyclin dependent kinases 4 6, which uh, causes a G1 to S phase transition. And it's just all what we all learned about in, in school that, you know, cells proliferate, and so they have cell cycles and they need you know, enzymes that help them move on and proliferate. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look at endocrine-resistant cell lines, they seem to be dependent on cyclin D1 and CDK4-6, even though we have yet to determine that any of those markers uh, make tumor cells more sensitive to CDK4-6 inhibition. Anyway, there's a nice picture there. Uh, the the uh, area here, there, one of the uh, interesting areas that started early on in looking at CDK4-6 inhibitors was that maybe this was uh, related to having having mutations in um, phospho-RB, uh, but the retinoblastoma gene, which is also kind of interesting because as a tumor suppressor, it's one of the first tumor suppressors that was identified. Uh, but it turns out that, you know, mutations in RB are very rare in breast cancer, and that if you have a mutation in RB, the CDK4-6 inhibitors can't work because the RB is not there to uh, block phosphorylation for. You know, you're not blocking the negative regulation. Uh, so uh, that's a rare thing, but it may be something that we look at in the future. Anyway, it's kind of a it's such a nice story because as shown in the bottom graph here, uh, Rich Finn and Dennis Slayman's lab looked at all these different cell lines and found that if you use the CDK4-6 inhibitor palbociclib, that you could see significant suppression of luminal cell lines and also HER2 amplified, which is an area of active study as well, but I'm not going to discuss. There are three CDK4-6 inhibitors, uh, one approved, palbociclib, a similar drug, ribociclib, which likely will be approved this year, uh, and then a third drug, which is quite different, and we'll talk about it in a moment, uh, abemaciclib. So we know that CDK4-6 inhibitors as first-line therapy for hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer that did not progress on uh, aromatase inhibitors uh, when added to the aromatase inhibitor letrozole resulted in a marked increase in progression-free survival, almost a doubling in PFS in uh, large phase three trials, the Paloma 2, uh, a two to one randomization, Mona Lisa 2, a one to one randomization. And because uh, Mona Lisa 2, the ribociclib trial, which was uh, presented at uh, ESMO, uh, actually had started, well, it started as uh, Paloma 2 was already gone going, but um, Paloma 1, the initial study, the phase 2 trial had already been uh, published, and there was accelerated approval of uh, palbociclib. So they had an early stopping rule uh, based on reaching a certain hazard ratio, and we see this in trials where we want to protect patients where a drug is shown to be effective uh, already in previous studies, a drug of the same class. So what happened was they ended up closing 
for superiority, essentially. Um, and what that means is that they didn't reach the end of their PFS yet in the ribocyclic group. And because of crossover, they may not reach it. We'll wait and see. They will get a, a number, but it may not be quite right, since some of those patients will have uh, gone on and received a CDK4-6 inhibitor potentially before progression. So that's what shows you here, independent review. No overall survival yet in these two trials. We wouldn't expect it yet. And remember, if you have a very long survival post-progression, you may not see survival benefit. And because we now have approval in the second line setting of CDK4-6 inhibitors, you're not going to get a patient population that really hasn't had CDK4-6 inhibition in the United States, which was a large part of the enrollment in these trials. Of course, we do subset analyses for these trials, and it was done just both for Paloma 2 and Mona Lisa 2. And what you can really see here is that here is equal, right, a hazard ratio of 1 for both of these. And what you can see is all of the little boxes, or the triangles, uh, all fall uh, to the left of 1. So basically what that means is you're not finding a single subgroup that benefits more. All of the subgroups seem to benefit. It's all the usual players uh, here, including uh, where you came from, your prior treatment, did you get adjuvant hormone therapy or not? And I think really importantly for, for us in practice, uh, whether or not you had visceral disease or not at the time of your first-line treatment. Um, and then toxicity is quite similar between these two agents as well. Uh, as you can see, and I think as you know, uh, neutropenia is quite common, uh, occurring in uh, certainly almost all patients, 80% at any grade. Uh, and then you see both grade 3 and grade 4 neutropenia. But as, again, you all know, this has not resulted in an increase in febrile neutropenia. It does not require growth factor support, although there's a slight increased risk in grade 1, 2 infections in both of these trials. There is some uh, fatigue, uh, a little bit of GI toxicity, sometimes on and off, but overall it's very well tolerated. One of the really irritating toxicities of CDK4-6 inhibitors that we've discovered over time is alopecia. So it's really important to warn your patients because I don't, I don't think our patients are going to not take an oral drug that do doubles their, almost doubles their PFS because they lose hair, but it's very distressing to the patients. And as they've asked me, you can't use cold caps for something you take every day by mouth. So so uh, you'll hear more about cold caps later. Anyway, it is a very irritating thing, and it doesn't seem to matter whether you give it with letrozole or fulvestrant, where we already see a little bit of hair loss. I think the really cool thing is that these drugs are so well tolerated compared to many targeted agents that we've given by mouth. You just don't see the you know, bad rash we see with EGFR uh, inhibitors. You don't see bad diarrhea. You don't see mouth sores. The one also very interesting thing to keep in mind is that uh, these, some patients do get grade 1 aphthous ulcers, which are irritating. And uh, the rate is probably between 10 and 20 percent of patients. There were studies haven't reported 20 percent because I think most people thought they were cold sores, but having treated lots and lots of patients now, I really do think it's not uncommon. It comes and goes. It's not very, uh, you know, every cycle. And we usually use this steroid dental paste to treat those aphthous ulcers because they respond the same as, for example, the Everolimus aphthous ulcers to uh, steroids. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind with your patients. Um, and then, you know, we want biomarkers, right? I mean, we heard this beautiful talk from Suzanne just before uh, mine uh, about all of the work that's going on, but the, so far we haven't found a biomarker that predicts benefit from the CDK4-6 inhibitors. Very nice work that Rich presented at ESMO this year showing, again, all of those little circles falling to the left of one on the dotted line, and you really, except for in tiny numbers like CD cyclin D1 negative, the, where there were 15 patients, you really didn't see uh, any differences based on biomarkers. Um, and then we saw this data at ESMO published right away afterwards in Lancet uh, uh, looking at fulvestrant in patients who had endocrine naive advanced breast cancer. This is a different group of patients than the patients who were in Paloma 2 in the Mona Lisa trial because these are patients who could not have had any hormone therapy in any setting, not early or late stage disease. They could have had chemotherapy and about a third of the patients received chemotherapy either in the adjuvant or metastatic setting. So you could have given chemo first and then gone on to hormone therapy. What they showed was an improvement in PFS overall in the patients treated with fulvestrant versus anastrozole. Uh, but then when you looked at the forest plots, actually they did see a difference, unlike what we saw with the CDK4-6 inhibitors, uh, where the difference in PFS appeared to be all in patients who did not have visceral disease, so had soft tissue like nodes and bone disease. 
And you can see here that the PFS goes from 13.8 to 22.3 months, so it's quite impressive. Um, and, uh, you know, the visceral disease in these patients, they had about somewhere between 40 to 49 percent of patients who did not have visceral disease. And then you see they're identical in the visceral disease patients. Why that is, maybe Suzanne can tell us. Uh, it's going to be something to do with the uh, mutations potentially acquired or already existent in these tumors uh, that make them more sensitive or less and have some that these uh, some of the tumors are more tro have more tropism to visceral organs, so really fascinating. No difference in overall survival to date. So if we look at these phase three first line studies in hormone receptor positive breast cancer, Paloma two, Mona Lisa two, and Falcon, and then compare PFS across the uh, tables and the numbers of patients, it's very helpful. We can kind of look at the fact that the PFS actually in the control arms are remarkably similar. It's something that we don't haven't seen in a lot of prior studies where we had different patient populations. And I think that's really, really helpful for us. We know, in general, in a mixed patient population, all of the trials had about half of the patients with visceral uh, metastases. Uh, that the PFS is a little around 14 months. Um, and then here's this subset analysis, which we only saw in Falcon and did not see any difference in subsets when you add the targeted agent. So that gives us some uh, idea about how we might be able to stratify patients and treat them potentially differently in the future. Of course, what we don't know, and I think that's, that's one area of great interest, is if you gave these patients who had no visceral disease, no prior endocrine therapy, fulvestrant, and then you added a CDK4-6 inhibitor, would they be on therapy for four years as a median PFS? We don't know, although presumably we'll know in the future. Uh, what about patients who progressed on prior non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors? Most of us treat our patients now in the adjuvant setting with uh, AIs, and uh, who knows how long we're going to treat those patients for. You'll hear more about that later this morning, since it seems to be a black box at the moment uh, in terms of extended adjuvant therapy. But we do see people who relapse on AIs or after, a, you know, within the first year. Uh, so what we know is in those patients, who uh, some of whom uh, a third or more have ESR1 mutations uh, that you'll hear about in a little bit uh, in Dabu's talk, uh, the PFS is also doubled or more than doubled, and there was an update of Paloma th uh, 3 actually at San Antonio by uh, Nick Turner in a poster showing that the uh, actual PFS in the uh, treatment arm is even longer than what it was in the initial presentation in New England Journal publication, so it's now out to 11.2 months from 4.6 months in the fulvestrant alone arm, uh, and then you can see Bolero 2, and this is actually really interesting to me, so just comparing it across, 4.1 versus 11 months in the central review, almost identical. Uh, so really, it suggests that we can use these agents uh, potentially in various sequences, because we don't believe that there's cross-resistance, at least to date. Uh, but we're seeing it, you know, you add a targeted agent, you get almost the same difference in PFS. It was kind of surprising to me when I actually looked at these numbers. And then you'll hear the precog study from Debu as well, and I'm just showing that in comparison because the numbers are almost the same yet again. So very interesting. Now, you did use exemestane in the control arm here, which may uh, change a little bit what your response is based on ESR1 mutations. Now, the third kin on the block is abemaciclib. This is a potent inhibitor of CDK4 more than CDK6, 14-fold more CDK4. So that's a difference between the other two agents. In a phase one trial, there was a response rate of 31% in hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. And then Monarch 1 was a study that we did looking to see what the single agent responses were to abemaciclib. Now, the background of this is that palbociclib and ribociclib have very low single agent responses, not worth giving by themselves. But in Monarch 1, in 132 extensively pretreated patients, so most of them had very hormone resistant disease, one to two prior chemo regimens, 90% with visceral metastases. So these are the patients you've given hormone therapy for a long time, and then they start progressing in. Uh, visceral organs. 50% had at least three positive uh, sites involved. The overall response rate was about 20%, all partial responses, and the be clinical benefit rate was 42%, and the median PFS was six months, which is quite impressive, I think, for a single agent in patients who have hormone-resistant visceral dominant disease. However, the trial was uh, actually powered and meant to find a response rate of 30 percent, similar to what the phase one trial showed. Uh, so it was a little less than what we had hoped, but still quite impressive for a single agent and gives us hope for the combination studies that are ongoing. The toxicity is different for abemaciclib than it is for ribo and palbo, presumably because its activity is different and also it blocks other CDKs uh, slightly differently than the way ribo and palbo do. Grade three diarrhea was seen in 20 percent 
percent, grade two in 29 percent, and you have to give these patients antidiarrheal therapy up front. And if you do and you educate patients similar to what we do, for example, uh, with our HER2 targeted therapy, pertuzumab, uh, patients can control their diarrhea fairly well. But my patients traveled with it in their pocketbook, you know, uh, antidiarrheal therapies, because they couldn't really predict when they were going to get it. There were a number of different subgroup analyses, and I'm just going to show you quickly a few of these posters. Uh, this was a subgroup analysis we did in Monarch 1, and we saw consistent single agent activity across the different subgroups analyzed. And these are small, but you can see that all the lines are pretty much lining up here. Here's the abemaciclib responses in a waterfall plot. And basically, no matter what subgroup you looked at, uh, we seem to see similar responses. So it was impossible to separate out one group of patients in this phase two single arm trial that benefited more than others. Uh, there was NeoMonarch, which was an oral presentation by Sarah Hurwitz, and also previous data had present, been presented at ESMO, a really fascinating neoadjuvant biomarker trial in about 220 patients. Patients received anastrozole, abemaciclib alone, or abemaciclib plus anastrozole. Um, and this data actually is shown here. Uh, and what they looked at was KI67, so a marker of stopping proliferation at two weeks and then at 16 weeks when the patients went on to surgery. The overall response rate was quite good by imaging, 55%. They only saw PCRs in three out of 95, which is kind of in the range we're expecting with hormone therapy. Uh, but what was really fascinating about this was that you got complete cell cycle blockade in the majority of patients within two weeks. So the KI-67 went down to less than 3% at two weeks in the majority of patients, as you can see here. And there didn't seem to be any difference in the patients who received the combination versus abemaciclib alone. And the other thing that was really fascinating that we saw in these biopsies that were done serially was that abemaciclib seemed to induce an immune infiltrate. And that suggests that you could potentially take the tumors that don't respond as well to immunotherapy because they have low proliferation and they don't induce an immune response, kind of opposite to the immune sculpting talk, which maybe we can talk about in our Q&A session. Uh, but you know, these slow growing hormone receptor positive tumors, they don't have much, they just don't, they're not immunogenic, they don't induce an immune response and uh, the response rates that I'll show you in a moment to checkpoint inhibitors so far with a tiny number of patients has been low. Uh, so if you could give something to induce an immune response, so an immune agonist, that might make a big difference. And there are targeted agent combinations ongoing and planned, uh, but a bemaciclib and a checkpoint inhibitor is an intriguing combination, and that is in fact being studied in a phase two trial, uh, which we actually just closed for a little while because of this data and are opening again in, uh, a little bit later this month. Uh, because we wanted to make sure there were safeguards in place in case you really were inducing a big immune response. Uh, now, unique uh, features we talked about, uh, diarrhea and the CDK4 six, four inhibition more than six and single agent efficacy, but a really cool area is that it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And this is a very interesting study that was presented at ASCO, actually, where they looked at plasma, uh, CSF, and resected tumor tissue, unbound concentrations of abemaciclib and its active species, because they gave these people abemaciclib for a couple of weeks, and then they had a brain, to, uh, brain metastasis resected, and they found very high high levels in brain. So there's actually a study which is now close to accrual that looks at abemaciclib in brain metastases that I expect we'll see data from very soon. We looked at a pooled analysis of palbociclib in all the Paloma trials in elderly patients, and you can see here that uh, the data looks very good, progression-free survival in elderly patients shown here, no new safety concerns. Uh, and we looked at patients, 10%, uh, 83 patients who were even 75 years and older. They don't seem to get uh, any additional serious toxicities, although myelosuppression, as you might guess, is a little bit more common, uh, but the incidence of grade three or more myelosuppression was similar across all age groups. So it's not anything that's gonna, you know, you just get grade two, which we don't even stop therapy for, an A and C between uh, 1 and 1.5. No increase in febrile neutropenia. There's a pooled analysis of long-term safety. The manuscript is almost done and ready to be submitted in 872 patients. Uh, the median duration of therapy is listed here. You can see that some people really get treatment for a very long period of time, uh, and they tolerate it very well. It doesn't appear that uh, over time the dose intensity decreases at all, and there was no evidence of cumulative or delayed toxicity. Interestingly, in my patient population, because I was uh, the first site to enroll 
available on Paloma too. So I've had patients on treatment now for many, many years. Uh, the alopecia continues. So I have a young woman who, you know, we took out her ovaries. She went on Paloma too. She's been on therapy for four years and her hair is thinning now in this last year, whereas my older patients tend to have hair thinning much earlier. So there is that cumulative effect. And then if patients got neutropenia, they keep getting neutropenia. So I have them tend to, if they're not on study, they come in at day 32 for their cell count check, not day 28. Do not have patients come in on day 26 or day 27 because it's more efficient because their counts will be low. So it's always worthwhile to push it back a couple of days rather than moving it forward. Now this is very interesting. The Paloma 3 study, uh, Turner had a poster looking at response to treatment post-progression uh, the, with the updated PFS shown in this curve that I showed you in the prior table. Uh, the most common sites of progressive disease were, of course, viscera, liver, and bone, as you would expect. Uh, and that shows you the numbers in the palbo versus placebo arms. No difference based on whether you took palbo cyclib or placebo, which is encouraging. Uh, and this data showed that the effect of palbociclib might be retained, although I think that's a bit of a stretch. But in any case, patients did respond to their next therapy, and this shows you all the different therapies in the palbo arm and fulvestrant and the placebo arm and fulvestrant, uh, showing that you continue to have a very reasonable PFS afterwards, but that these, this arm here, mainly because you got better PFS with the palbociclib arm, continues to be out. So these patients on their second line of therapy are, still had a longer time from when they started treatment than the patients who were on the, uh, palbo, the placebo arm. And that was regardless of therapy, whether they got chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, or targeted therapy is listed here. And here's the PFS in these two arms, but it's time to end of next line therapy that they're really showing here. Uh, so very interesting, I think, and that's kind of nice to know that you can keep using your therapies in sequence. And then uh, Joyce O'Shaughnessy had a poster of the impact in the 35% uh, or so of patients who had de novo uh, metastatic breast cancer in the uh, Mona Lisa 2 trial. And you can see that uh, you're seeing the same kind of improvement in progression-free survival. Uh, and it was uh, not reached diverse, uh, as well in this group. They, the clinical benefit was also very, very good in patients with de novo uh, metastatic breast cancer. So it suggests that there's no subgroup differences in this group. And then they looked at the impact of visceral versus is bone metastasis, Skip Burris showed this, um, and uh, there was benefit in both groups as we saw in the previous uh, pre-planned uh, patient subgroup analysis. Uh, so what about resistance to CDK inhibitors? Where are we going in the future in this? And then we'll go on to immunotherapy. There are at least three distinct mechanisms, and this was discussed actually in an education session, a really great education session by Tut at, uh, uh, at by Turner actually, uh, at San Antonio. Loss of retinoblastoma I mentioned is a very small number of patients where you have this mutation and it doesn't work. Maybe it's selected, but we haven't seen that yet in any of our clinical trials. I think we'll see that data in the future. You could buy plus the CDK46 uh, dependency by cyclin E amplification, or you could have inadequate inhibition. Uh, they have very fascinating recent data published in cancer research showing that uh, actually you could potentially uh, overcome that ability, that resistance, prevent resistance by doing a triplet. Uh, and so if you use the agents up front, uh, you uh, could overcome the, the ability of the uh, cancer cells to develop the resistance over time. But once the tumors already had developed resistance, you couldn't resensitize. And this is with combinations with PI3 kinase inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors. Some of the ongoing trials are shown there. There's a fascinating drug called jetatolisib, which is an IV uh, PI3 kinase mTOR combined inhibitor, where I've had patients who clearly progressed on palbo or abemaciclib who've had really dramatic, rapid responses to the combination of jetatolisib palbociclib and either letrozole or fulvestrant within a week of starting therapy where visceral disease shrunk, where lymphangitic spread in the lungs went away, you know, the symptoms went away, really just unbelievable responses. Drug has toxicity, of course, but I think that it shows that we're uh, getting going in the right direction with these combinations. So there's more data to come for CDK4-6 inhibitors. I'm happy to share my slides with anybody. Uh, who wants them, a number of different trials in the adjuvant, post-neoadjuvant setting in combination compared to capecitabine, adjuvant trial for ribociclib opening, and then a number of trials with abemaciclib as well, uh, and combinations with uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So what could we do in treating our patients? You have conventional endocrine monotherapy, AI alone, followed by eximestane. 
Um, and I don't know, it looks like some of these are a little funny. So then you have um, AI or fulvestrant with Everolimus and all of these that just seem to have changed with moving them around. Uh, but that basically you could select the type of endocrine therapy you wanted to give to your patient uh, based on what their prior exposure to endocrine therapy was and whether or not they had visceral disease. And I think you'll hear more about that in the next talk. So I think it'll, it's quite interesting question maybe for our Q&A session. So what about immunotherapy for breast cancer in my last few minutes? Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are all of the rage. There are both uh, the tills that are in the stroma and also around the tumor cells themselves. It turns out that tills around the tumor aren't so common and it probably doesn't matter. And the stromal tills are the most important ones to look at, which is good because they're easier to see. Um, and it does turn out that you have more tills at diagnosis if you have a nasty cancer, a more rapidly proliferative cancer, potentially with a more mutational load is the way we thought about it, although this immune sculpting looks at it a different way, and we don't really know the answer yet. But if you have higher number of tills, and particularly CD8 positive tills, these are the T cells that help us fight cancer in general, uh, you seem to have a better response to chemotherapy, longer disease-free, and overall survival from your cancer, which is interesting. If your tumor is able to escape the host immune system, you don't do as well. These are cancers for whatever reason, and maybe those cancers do in the long run have a higher mutational load, but that somehow they can escape recognition as being foreign. Uh, so TILS are prognostic and triple negative breast cancer treated with adjuvant chemotherapy in the Breast International Group trial shown by Shireen Loy, and you can see these curves. Also, you can see that there were more TILS in the triple negative and HER2 positive breast cancers, just these lines are higher. Um, and then uh, Shireen presented at San Antonio a year ago, actually looking at TILs greater than or equal to 20%, even in node negative, triple negative breast cancer was associated with a much better outcome. And you'll just have to believe me that if you had really high TILs, these patients did extraordinarily well overall with triple negative breast cancer. So maybe in the future, we could actually tailor our intensity of chemotherapy in these patients, although we're not ready to do that quite yet. Uh, so uh, this is a, one of the studies that was presented at San Antonio by Denkert, uh, looking at a meta-analysis of almost 4,000 patients in the German breast cancer uh, group trials, and they have all the tumor tissues in these patients. It's really pretty amazing uh, and powerful group. And they found TILs were more frequent in triple negative breast cancers. It's the largest single study to look at uh, TILs, and 30% in triple negative breast cancer and 19% in HER2 positive had high numbers, not just TILs, but high numbers, 13% in luminal tumors, uh, and that's all shown here with high uh, being greater or equal to 60 percent, intermediate or low. And it's really pretty obvious here that the luminal tumors have a, a much higher low number than the others. Uh, and then TILs were linked to increased pathologic complete response rates in all subgroups and were associated with overall survival for triple negative breast cancer and HER2 positive breast cancer. A low TILs were associated with overall survival for luminal disease. And I really think that, you know, the locusts and our mists, the things that will survive the nuclear holocaust, are these more proliferative luminal tumors. So uh, they're ER positive, but more proliferative hormone-resistant tumors do very poorly, and we need to understand how to overcome uh, the resistance in that group, and maybe CDK4-6 inhibitors or triplets will be one of our mechanisms of doing that. Um, and then TILs were also presented by Lewin in the Cleopatra trial. Uh, they're more common in ER-negative HER2-positive breast cancer. Well, what has the best response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy? ER negative HER2 positive breast cancer. This is the HER2 enriched subgroup that people have been talking about where we may be able to tailor therapy to give less treatment because they, their tumors are so exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy with HER2 targeted uh, combinations. Uh, lower TILs were found in the metastatic tumor than the primary, which is actually kind of intriguing and suggests, actually supports a little bit of that immune sculpting idea that I indeed when you get a bigger mutational load, you actually can escape the immune system more effectively effectively and you have less TILs. They had a decrease in all visceral sites except for lungs, and overall survival was associated with a mean TIL level in the Cleopatra trial with a linear impact. So it suggests, again, just like Shireen Loy presented, so now we have multiple trials showing the same thing, that with every 10 percent increase in TILs, you have a reduction in risk of death. So maybe that's something we could manipulate in the future. We'll see. 
Um, so then you heard about the immune sculpting of the triple negative breast cancer genome, but I just wanted to show you this table with immune-rich triple negative breast cancers and immune-poor triple negative breast cancers showing uh, that the high mutational load here, we talked a lot about neoantigens and mutational load at San Antonio and at ASCO, but it may be that once you get to a certain load and something about those mutations allows you to escape the immune response, and that's where we really need to target our treatments, and I'll show you that in a moment. We are targeting the PD-1 pathway, as you know, and you answered that. This is a summary of our trials with PD-1, PD-L1 blockade in breast cancer, and you can see that the overall response rates have a big range here. So 4.8 percent overall in the avolumab trial, 18.5 percent and 19 percent in triple negative breast cancer, 12 percent in ER positive breast cancer. The one thing that we don't know is whether or not PDL1 positivity is important for response to, tr to uh, PDL1 or PD1 inhibitors in breast cancer. So far, absolutely no difference in response in the avolumab trial when they looked at PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative tumors. So we don't know that that's a selection factor yet that determines any kind of sensitivity for uh, breast cancer as yet, and those studies are going on. Uh, we understand that combinations may enhance the host immune response. That's what we need to do for breast cancer, is enhance that host immune response. So how could we do that? Well, one area is combinations with chemotherapy. Sylvia Adams has shown in this phase uh, two, phase 1B, really, uh, combination study that you can see very good response rates in patients given nab paclitaxel and atezolizumab, and the response rates are shown here. Very small numbers. It doesn't show that chemotherapy plus a pd one inhibitor is better than a pdl one inhibitor or better than chemo alone in breast cancer yet, but we know it's tolerable and very encouraging. So that led to this uh, randomized trial, which is accruing very nicely and hopefully will complete accrual this year, looking at atezolizumab with placebo uh, with uh, nab paclitaxel or placebo with nab paclitaxel as first-line therapy for metastatic breast cancer in 900 patients double-blinded without unblinding. So maybe this will be a clean study and we'll be able to actually look at survival. There's also combinations with different targeted agents, which may enhance the immune response and be immune agonists. Fascinating data with MEK inhibitors from Shireen Loy and Justin Balco from uh, Australia and from Vanderbilt. And that led in part to this trial, which has been funded by a grant from the Breast Cancer Research Foundation and will be led through the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium that's looking at a variety of different immune agonists, a 4-1-BB and OX-40 agonists, and binimetinib, which is a MEK inhibitor, combined with the PDL one inhibitor avolumab in a phase two multi-arm I spy two like trial. You'll hear more about that in a while. There are multiple ongoing trials with different combinations. Of course, everybody's excited about trying to enhance the immune response and make checkpoint inhibitors work in breast cancer. And we'll see a lot of data on this over the next few years. With this, we're raising the bar in the treatment of breast cancer. Thanks for your attention.